Welcome, church family. My name is Josh Shalib. I'm one of the pastors here at Life Church. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Uh, our prayer is that you would lean in uh, and engage your heart as you and your family join us for worship today.
Come on, let's sing this out. Let's sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Let's sing a little louder. Oh, 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 sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Let's sing a little louder. Oh, louder than the unbelief. Oh, sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, heaven comes oh, we sing it out. me. Oh, sing between where amazing me and this reckoning 
nothing stands between us. I have all that you say I have. When you're around, you're still standing. I am still standing. You're still standing, Lord. I am all you said I have, Lord. Never change, never change, Lord. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between your love. Oh, nothing, nothing. Nothing stands between your mercy, oh, your nothing. kindness. Nothing stands between your grace. Nothing stands between. Nothing stands between your love. Nothing stands between your grace. Come on, let's sing that. Nothing stands. Nothing stands between your love. Nothing stands between your grace. Oh, nothing. Nothing, nothing stands between your love. It's washing over me, Lord. Nothing stands. Between your grace, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing stands between your love anymore. Oh, nothing stands between your grace. So nothing stands between your love. You're so loving, Lord. Nothing stands between your grace. Nothing stands between your love and your children. And nothing stands between your grace. Oh, thank you, God. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I am a child.
your word says that we have but we have faith and not fear when we are your children and we have everything that you provided for us when you died on that cross and we stand now in a new covenant Lord saying that we are yours and you are ours God we thank you for what you're going to do God we thank you for how you're moving mightily already God we thank you for how you're just going to continue to speak faith life and hope into every situation we love you and we thank you. God, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. And in the mighty name of Jesus, church, everybody said a good amen. amen. What an amazing time of worship. Once again, we just want to welcome you to Life Church. We thank you for joining us this morning. If this is your first time joining Life Church, we ask that you would take just a quick second and text the word connection to 31996. Uh, and through that, just fill out the quick form that's on there. It lets us know that you visited with us online here today. Uh, but also, it allows us to answer any questions you may have uh, and really partner with you in prayer over this next season. Uh, we also want to make sure that you're aware on our social media platforms, we're doing some, some different things uh, over this next season. And one of those is at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., our staff is going to be releasing short devotions, encouraging videos, things like that, just to uplift those timelines. So many times those new feed, news feeds can become uh, just dark. And so we want to do uh, what we can to speak life and let hope rise over this next season. Uh, even though we're doing church online, we also want to give you the opportunity to give. And so as you prepare your gift, I want to remind you of a passage I was reading this morning. Uh, in John 14, 1, it says, don't let this throw you. Trust God. And so as you seek God about how he would have you be obedient with your tithes and offerings, I just want to encourage you, don't let fear be the determining factor. Uh, trust him and follow out however he leads. Uh, as we uh, are transitioning to our message time this morning, I want to encourage you to, to lean in, have open hearts, and let's really seek after what God has given Pastor uh, to share with us this morning. Can't wait to see you uh, in person again, but in the meantime, know that we're praying for you and we love you. Let's take this moment now and lean in for our pastor. I just want to thank you so very much for joining us uh, here today at Life Church Online for our worship gathering. In just a moment, I'm going to begin to unpack a message that I'm trusting is going to build your faith. It's going to encourage you. Uh, so I'm going to be giving a lot of scripture to you today. So if you have a way of, of some, maybe writing down some of the references, either on your phone or on your iPad, perhaps in a notebook, I want to give you a lot of scripture today so that throughout the weeks ahead, you can meditate on those and allow those to encourage you in your faith. There's a psalm that has become really uh, popular in my heart, really important to me in recent days and weeks. It's a song called It Is Well. It's a newer version of it given to us by Bethel Ministry. And here's a couple of the lines from the refrain. It says, through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you and it is well with me. One of the most important things that we can do while walking in these uncertain days, these dark and difficult days, one of the most important things we can do is focus our faith, hang on to our hope, and keep our eyes on God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, there's a story about a king by the name of Jehoshaphat 
who was facing an enemy army. He was just going about his normal day, everything. He woke up that morning and everything was like it always was. But seemingly out of nowhere comes all these reports that things are happening in his world that he was unfamiliar with, things that he was unprepared for. And there's a, a large enemy army that's surrounding him. And what ends up happening is he realizes he's facing an enemy, uh, far, far, an enemy, enemy army that's far superior to anything he has. And in verse 12, you begin to hear the cry of his heart. He begins to cry out to God. He says, oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. He feels helpless and he feels hopeless. And then he makes this declaration. Nor do we know what to do. Our eyes are upon you. In times of crisis, in times of national emergency, Jehoshaphat looked to God for his help. David in Psalm 121, he gives us some similar instruction when he says this. He said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And then I want to just drop down to verse two for a moment. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. When we are faced with discouragement, with overwhelming odds, with uh, facing intense persecution, perhaps, we need to turn to God and look to him to be our helper. There's also a moment in the New Testament with a group of Christ followers in the book of Hebrews who were finding themselves in a very similar situation to Jehoshaphat, feeling overwhelmed by their circumstances, feeling under the weight of their pressure and the burden of what was going on around them in their contemporary society. And in chapter 12 of Hebrews, we read these words. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now, when I see that word weight, I have to pause. Because when I think of a weight in our contemporary language, it's a burden, it's a fear, it's a concern, it's a feeling of uncertainty in the air around us. He's saying, let us lay aside every weight, all of that stuff, and the sin which does so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance, that word means patience and steadfastness, the race that is set before us. He flows immediately into his next thought by saying this, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The direction in which we look determines what we see. A short stanza from an old poem says this, two men stood behind the bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. The direction in which you look determines what you see. It says one man saw mud. That's because he's looking down. The other saw stars and that's because he's looking up. And so the direction in which you look determines what you see. David lifted his eyes under the hills because he knew his help was coming from God. The writer to Hebrews said, looking unto Jesus in order to look to the hills, in order to look to Jesus, in order to see the stars, we have to look away from other things. And sometimes we have to shut off the television. Sometimes we have to lay down our, our mobile device and we need to focus on God again. And the best way to do that is pick up the word, begin to read, go into a time of personal worship. You see, like King Jehoshaphat, we may feel overwhelmed by the crisis facing our country and our world during this time. But like Jehoshaphat, we too must be able to say, oh God, will you not judge those who are coming against us? We don't know what to do. We have no idea where to turn or what to do, but God, our eyes are upon you. Dropping down to verse 14, we read this. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattiah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. So the spirit of God came upon a prophet and that prophet's name was Jehaziel and he began to speak and here's what he said. Listen, all you Judah, all you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not your battle. The battle is the Lord's. The opening words of that prophecy immediately 
challenge us to not be afraid. The opening words of that prophecy say to us, do not be afraid, nor dismayed. In other words, feeling in despair. And he says, for the battle's not your battle, it's the Lord's. I want you to allow those words to sink into your heart today and calm all the fears that are going on in your life and in your mind. The battle's not your battle. The battle's the Lord's battle. As we have said many times over the last many weeks here at Life Church, um, New Testament gives us three primary purposes of prophecy. We find those recorded for us in 1 Corinthians 14, 3. I'm going to read this to you from the New International Reader's Version. It says this, but the person who prophesies speaks to people this. That person prophesies for these three reasons, to make people stronger, to give them hope, and to comfort them. So in my mind, it's really, really simple. Three primary purposes of prophecy are strength, hope, and comfort. Strength, hope, and comfort. Here's the thing. Hope gives us strength. Hope gives us comfort. If we remove hope from the the equation, we lose out on strength. And if we move hope out of the equation, we lose out on the comfort that hope is designed to bring us. Hope is a key ingredient because hope gives you strength. Hope gives you comfort. So let's talk about hope. If I could title this message, just the theme of our year here at Life Church is simply let hope rise. On May the 23rd, 1939, the submarine Squalus sank off the coast of New Hampshire. The entire crew of 33 men were trapped in that sunken hole. Now they were, they were saved later, but before they were saved, the, the, the rescue divers went down, they descended, they approached the hull of the ship. And they heard these tapping sounds coming from inside the sunken hull. It was the longs and the shorts of what we know as Morse code. And the message that they were sending to those who were coming to rescue them was very, very clear. It was simply this, is there any hope? In the face of our current national emergency, I dare say there are many, perhaps some watching today, many who are asking that very same question. Is there any hope? The word hope is mentioned 151 times in the New King James Version of the Bible. So hope is a major theme that is found in the Bible, both in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, because God evidently knew there were going to be times in our lives when we were going to be needing some hope and sometimes an added measure of hope, such as the days in which we are living. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse one, the Bible says that that hope is the uh, excuse me. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. So what we find right there is he says faith is the substance of things hoped for. And so I've come to the conclusion that, that it's hope that fuels our faith. I like to put it this way. Hope is the power cell. Hope is the the power unit. Hope is the battery to your faith. Just like your flashlight needs a battery in order to be functional and effective, your faith needs hope in order to be functional and effective. Likewise, it is hope is what gives power to your faith, making it effective in everyday life. Now, there's an Old Testament account concerning a man by the name of, of Abraham that provides us, I think, a really, really good illustration. While most people associate Abraham with faith, he's also, quite frankly, a person who possessed great, great hope. The Bible tells us that Abraham and his wife were going through life and they were trying to have children and she was barren. They simply couldn't bear children. The older they got, the more desperate they got. The older they got, the less hope they had. The older they got, the more they found themselves feeling hopeless in the ability to have children. And in this, in the natural, it was seemingly a a hopeless situation. But God said something to Abraham. He said, I want you to leave the tent. I want you to leave your dwelling place. I want you to go outside and I want you to look up. And he said, Abraham, try to count the stars because your offspring, your children, your grandchildren, your descendants are going to be more numerable than all of the stars that you see up in the sky. And so he literally was saying to Abraham, you are going to be a father and your wife, Sarah, is going to be a mother. And even though their situation seemed impossible, even though their situation seemed hopeless in the moment, 
they ultimately had a little boy by the name of Isaac. Now listen to the words recorded for us in the book of Romans concerning their story and their account. It says in Romans chapter four, beginning at verse 18, describing the journey and the expression of hope on the, base, on the part of, of Abraham says, who contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to that what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. See what that verse is saying is God demonstrated his power in, in his life, in Abraham's life. And it now is confirmed in the New Testament scripture what God did. Now watch. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, meaning the inability to produce children, seeing he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. But here's the part that I love the most. And this is where I hope I can get you today. He did not waver at the promise of God. I grew up singing a song, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. When I pick up my Bible, I consider this God speaking to me. And so when God makes a promise through his word, I take it as such that God is making a promise to me. And in moments like this, in the days in, in, in which we are living, I pick up my Bible and just like Abraham, I choose to not waver, not blow with the wind back and forth. I choose to not waver at the promises of God through unbelief. But it says here, he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. That last phrase, he was able to perform. It reminds me of three Hebrew boys back in, in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were their names. The society in which they were living were requiring them to, to submit, to bow to an idol of King Nebuchadnezzar. And they, King Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow, you're going to burn. And those three Hebrew boys, full of faith, full of confidence in the God they serve, said, we're not going to bow and we're not going to burn either. He said, okay, then we're going to throw you into a fiery furnace and you're going to die in that fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not, we're not even going to be careful to answer you in this. But they said, but here's what we are going to say to you, King. Our God is able and he will deliver us from your hand O king. Well, the way the story plays out is a group of soldiers tied them, hand bound them, hand and foot, and dropped them into this fire that was heated seven times hotter. The guys that dropped them in died just from the heat blast, but they were dropped into a fiery furnace. And the Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar peeked in through a window and he said, did we not send in there three and they said, yeah, we put in three. He said, then why do I count four? And the fourth is like unto the Son of God. The only thing that ended up burning, because the Bible says they, found, they were found walking in the midst of the fire, the only thing that burned were the ropes that held them. The point I'm trying to help us get to here is, not only was, was uh, Abraham convinced that God was able, those three Hebrew boys were convinced that he was able, but so is another guy. There's a guy by the name of Paul the Apostle who in the book of Ephesians said this, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to his power that is at work within us. I want us to come along on this journey with Abraham today and get to a place in our faith so that we are fully convinced that what he has promised he was also able to perform it. Abraham had hope in God's word in spite of what he maybe saw when he looked in the mirror or what he looked at when he saw his wife. Sarah, they're both way out of the age boundaries of being able to have children. He had hope in God's word in spite, in spite of what the calendar, or maybe if you had a birth certificate back then would have said, and so we look at this and he had hope in God's word in spite of the medical reports. I'll get real, real with you. He had hope in God's word as he were here today in spite of the news reports and the, and the statistics and all that's coming out. He had hope in God's word regardless of what man said concerning the situation. In Psalm 119, verse 81, David declares this. He said, my soul faints for your salvation, but... I hope in your word. I've taught our congregation numerous times. The word but is, an, is, a, is a verbal eraser. I could say to my wife, Janice, you look gorgeous tonight. And if I pause 
she knows there's a but because then I can say, but I really don't like the clothing you're wearing. She'll forget that I said she looked gorgeous and all she's going to hear is, I don't like the clothing you're wearing. The word but is a verbal eraser. David is saying, my soul faints, but. So he erases what he just said and he makes this declaration, but I hope in your word. Then in Psalm 119, verse 114, David says this, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. One more time, Psalm 119, verse 147. This is three times in one chapter of the Bible. David says, I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I can tell you, I'm an early riser. I love getting up early in the morning. I love starting my day. It's still dark when I leave my house most times. But I know that at the dawning of the day, as I cry for help to God, I can only put my hope in one place. He, David goes on and says, and I cry for help. I hope in your word. Now I'm gonna be very blunt with you right here. My hope does not rest upon words of men. My hope does not rest upon the words that men may speak. My hope rests upon the everlasting, eternal edict of God himself. My hope rests on God's word. Now, according to Hebrews chapter one and verse three, all things rest on God's word. The writer to Hebrews says this, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. This verse of scripture, in the middle of it, gives this little capsule of truth. It lets us know that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, if you drop all the way back to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, what you discover is God created all things with his word. The Bible says that, and he said, let there be light, and there was light. And God spoke creation into existence. And so we know that God created all things with his word, but this verse tells us he not only created all things with his word, he upholds, strengthens, sustains, everything rests upon his word. So my hope rests upon God's word because ultimately my hope is in God himself. I so appreciate, I so appreciate how, how David dealt with the dark and the difficult the disappointing, the discouraging days of his life. In Psalms 38, verse 15, in a very difficult moment, David makes this declaration. He said, for in you, O Lord, I hope. For in you, O Lord, I hope. I'm gonna slow that down and I want that to literally settle, not just in your heart, but in your mind. For in you, O Lord, I hope you will hear, O oh Lord, my God. I, I know that in, in days like this, we, we look to various agencies, we look to various departments, we look to various uh, parts in, of our government and, and our community, but the place we need to look for hope is in God. In Psalms 42, 11, he continues on by saying this, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Now, I got a crazy imagination. Uh, I have this sense that, that David looks in the mirror one day and he says, whoa, dude, you look really, really bad. You look like you're under a heavy weight. You're going through a lot. Okay, soul, I'm just gonna take you to task. Why are you cast down? Why are you all disquieted? Why are you down in the dumps? Why are you so depressed? And why are you so discouraged? Hope in God. In one of those moments, David just comes to grip with himself, just like he does in Psalm 103. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. I know that in my own life, there are times when I'm walking through the difficulties of life, just like we as a, as a society and a culture are right now. And there are times I have to talk to myself. I have to have my spirit man talk to my soul, which is my mind, my will, my will, and my emotions. I have to tell my spirit man, hey, soul, get in line. I'm telling you, hope 
in God. Now, one of the moments uh, of David's life, one of the seasons of David's life that was so, so difficult and yet so relatable to us is found in Psalms 39 and verse 7. I'm going to read this to you from the Message Bible. David simply says this, What am I hoping, what am I doing rather in the meantime, Lord? Hoping, that's what I'm doing, hoping. At this moment in David's life, he was walking out some of the most dark and the most difficult moments of his entire life journey. He was so beaten down by his circumstances. He was so discouraged by all the news reports and all the information that was swirling around him in life. He felt forsaken. He felt abandoned. He felt alone and he felt hopeless. And in the Message Bible, he simply says, what am I doing in the meantime, Lord? Hoping, that's what I'm doing, hoping. Now my eyes zero in on one word, meantime. Meantime is a word made up of two words, mean and time. So I back up and I say, what am I going to do, Ed, in these mean times of life? In the mean times of life, in the distasteful times of life, in the fear-filled times of life, what am I going to do in the mean times of life? I'm going to hope in the Lord. That's what I choose to do. I'm going to hope in the Lord. David then says it this way in the Passion Translation. He says, and now God, I'm left with one conclusion. My only hope is to hope in you alone. With all that is going on in the world around us, with all that's happening in our country, we've got to maintain our hope in God. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes this to the church in, in verse 16. He says, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father encourage you and, and, and strengthen you in every good thing you do and in every good thing you say. God loved us and through his grace he gave us a good hope and encouragement that continues forever. I love how the Passion Translation, it's a real new translation, renders that same verse. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father God, who loved us and in his wonderful grace gave us eternal comfort and a beautiful hope, I love this last phrase, that cannot fail. Now abideth faith, hope, and love. It abides forever. What I want us to realize today is that in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, we can have a hope that literally is, is, is an enduring hope. He says this, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying that as we pick up our Bibles, when we dive into books of the Bible, like the book of Psalms, a great one, because the book of Psalms literally touches every emotion known to man. When we pick up our Bible, he's saying they teach us and they encourage us in our hope. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, in the New International Version, Paul says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Can I pause there? I'll come back to that in a moment. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. If we could do anything before we end this worship gathering today is flip the switch of trust in God because as we trust in God, the scripture tells us we're going to have a complete peace. Now let's go back to this. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've got a glass here. It's partially filled with water. You probably can't see it, but there's a lot of room in there for more water to be poured into it. If I kept pouring water into this glass, eventually it would overflow. Let's picture the water as hope. And our level of hope or our water table of hope needs to rise to the point where it overflows. The Holy Spirit is that power, that ability that gives us an overflowing sense of hope. 
Now, who is the scripture speaking of here? The God of hope. God is the God of hope, not the God of despair. He's the God of hope. He's not the God of doubt. He's not the God of gloom and doom. He's the God of hope. And he wants you, he wants me to overflow in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. One last biblical illustration given to us uh, is found in the account of a man by the name of Job. Um, his journey is really unusual. The Bible says he's a righteous man. He was a very well-known man, very wealthy man in the land of Uz. And he had children. They would go out and they would celebrate in each other's homes. And uh, one day Satan decides he's going to go before God and he's going to, he's going to, look for an opportunity to, to mess with Job, and he does. He, he kills off Job's kids. He destroys his flocks, destroys his home. Everything that was important to Job was taken from him in one day. Sudden disaster came out of nowhere and hit Job on one day. The Bible says that he tore his shirt sleeve, which is what they did back then, threw ashes on his face, and he knelt to the ground, and he began to worship after all of his experiences, after all the comments and the criticisms that came at him from his own wife, his friends, Job emerges for a moment. He emerges for just a moment from his emergency. And here's a declaration he makes. He says, for there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again and its tender shoots will not cease. Now in my mind's eye, I see a very determined, a very decisive Job declare his very audacious hope in God. In the face of uncertainty, in the face of calamity, in the face of the loss of his income, his savings, his family, his health, his job, his security, in the face of all this different kind of loss, his words are very deliberate, his words are very decisive. He simply utters these three words, there is hope. We are all facing a lot of things in the days ahead and not knowing what they are, being uncertain of what it looks like. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to declare three words over you today. There is hope. I love the old hymn of the church. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Ladies and gentlemen, our hope uh, that is rooted in the word of God is in a good place because ours is a hope that is rooted in the word of God, but it's also rooted in the God of the word. When faced with a seemingly hopeless situation, there's a story of a Shunammite woman back in the book of 2 Kings. She had received a baby at the end of a prophetic word given to her by the prophet Elisha. Sometime later, the baby dies of a sunstroke and she runs, to the, runs back to the prophet. And in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 26, as she's approaching the prophet, the prophet says to Gehazi, go out, Gehazi, go out and talk to her and ask her these questions. And he says, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? Knowing that the child is already dead, she still answered, it is well. Now she obviously knew that her son was dead, but she said it is well because she knew God could turn her hopeless situation around. She put her faith, she put her hope in God and she allowed her to, herself to declare even in the midst of difficulty, it is well. Going back to the song I started with, through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through everything we're going through right now in America and around the world, we need to be able to say our eyes are on God. And when we say that, we're also gonna be able to say, it is well with me. I wanna pause and at the end of this gathering today, and I wanna pray for you. We are obviously facing some difficult things in our culture and in our society, in our country, in our world. But this much I know, my God is able. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. So I want this message of hope to fuel your faith 
and your belief and trust in God. And as we do, I'm going to believe that hope is going to rise in our hearts and in our lives. Father, I pray for each uh, person that is viewing us online today for hope to rise in their hearts. I pray that God, you will somehow settle their hearts, settle their minds, cause all fear to dissipate, cause the uncertainty of life to go literally into a back seat, so to speak, and may their hearts be encouraged. May their hearts be filled with overflowing sense of hope. I ask you to do that now in Jesus name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today at Life Church Online. And uh, I would love for you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your family to watch us next time. And we know that God is going to continue to walk this out with us because he said he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. God bless you until next time. What a great message from our pastor today. I uh, want to remind you before you sign off about our 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. posts that will be hitting social media. Use those as a way to let hope rise in the social world and in the world around you. Uh, also, don't, be, don't let fear drive you in these moments. Know that your staff is praying for you. We love you. We can't wait to see you again. But let your house become a hub for hope to rise in the communities around you. We love you and we can't wait to see you.